All right, chip of the day. What's, uh, what's the chip of the day? It is a Max uh, 338 ESE. Um, got these in a grab bag at the store, so had to have them. Uh, haven't had one of these before. So what is a Max 338? Well, it's an eight channel low leakage CMOS analog multiplexer. Now I did a video on multiplexers before, and there's a whole bunch of standard multiplexers and analog switches and stuff in the DG series, okay? So this claims it is a direct replacement for the DG508 and 509, depending if it's a 338 or 339. So we have the 338. So we're a direct replacement for a DG508. So it's just a better part. It's better specs, lower leakage, uh, you know, that, all that kind of stuff. So uh, they're great for, what does it say? Great for data acquisition, test equipment, military radios, sampling holds. It's got really good leakage, so that sampling holds, uh, heads-up display, all kinds of stuff, right? So multiplexers are used a lot. I, I use these uh, quite a bit when I was doing um, instrumentation design where I had one A to D, like a big master expensive A to D, and then I routed all the signals over to, to use to the A to D um, through, through multiplexers. Uh, 8 channel, 16 channel multiplexers and stuff like that. So they were very, very handy. Um, and let's see here. Uh, also, one of the things I was sort of proud of on one of the instruments that I did was there was a chain of processing. And for troubleshooting reasons, I, I brought off different points in the chain and brought them to a multiplexer. So I could, in software, interrogate each piece across the, uh, the chain of circuit, and it could do a self-test. You know, is the signal here? Yes. Is the signal here? Yes. Is the signal here? No. Well, then this part must be bad. And then you could tell the user what was bad. So yeah, uh, multiple cases are great. They're cheap and just put sprinkle them in. Um, so what's the claim to fame of this guy? Uh, about 220 ohms of resistance. So that's another thing you need to be aware of. It's not like a relay where you have almost zero ohms or you think, well, it's a FET and they're like really, really low ohm FETs, 0.04 ohm FETs or something. No, these are fairly high uh, resistance. But if you're measuring voltages, you don't care. An extra 200 ohms doesn't, doesn't matter. Uh, so yeah, so these are 220 ohms. Uh, let's see here. Leakage currents, 40 nanoamps. Uh, leakage currents, yeah, 40 nanoamps. That's pretty small. Let's see here. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, no, 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 no. It's much, much better than that. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> 0 0.005 nanoamps. Yeah, there we go. There we go at, at uh, room temperature. Um, 0 0.005 nanoamps. Yeah, that's, uh, that's pretty small, right? That's uh, five picoamps. Uh, yeah, pretty small. Pretty small. All right. Uh, other things to know. Um, here's something to know. So in order to make this video worthwhile, <laughs> um, one of the things you should be aware of is the supply voltages on an analog switch. Now, if an analog switch is being run from zero to 12 volts, then your signals that you're using have to be within that range, right? And uh, usually, like for this one here, uh, they're giving you a graph of the on resistance versus what what the rails are, what the what the voltage rails are. So if you're running at a, a plus and minus 20 volts, it's it's the best. If you're operating at a plus and minus five volts, it's not too good. And in fact, it changes depending on what the input voltage is and stuff. So if you want to use these um, switches really well, use the largest supply uh, uh, voltages that you have. So in a typical circuit, plus minus 15 volts would be really, really good with this, with this part, right? Uh, plus minus five volts, eh, not so much, right? It'll work, but you need to be aware of what's going on. And there's a bunch of other, other graphs for um, different voltage conditions. All right, let's, uh, let's hook one up. Uh, these are SO16 parts, 16 pin, yeah, SO16s. And so I have a little uh, adapter board here that I've put a part on, so I can put it on my breadboard. And uh, let's hook up some power to it, yeah. 
All right, I'm going to be supplying plus and minus 15 volts. Let's turn that on. So those, that's, our, that's our voltage rails. And I'm going to be using uh, a ohm meter. So we're going to go directly across one of those switches and we're going to measure its ohmage. All right, there we go. So I'm, look, I'm reading the um, resistance across a switch that's open. And this meter won't even measure it. It's too high of uh, mega ohms that this meter won't even measure it. We'll change to another meter that can measure it and see what that actually is. But if I turn the switch on, I have a little button here I can put turn switch on, 185 ohms, right? So uh, that's certainly within the, within the specification. And uh, yeah, so there you go. You can measure these things directly. Uh, it was such a high, uh, high uh, open that we will use my Keithley uh, meter here and let's see what it thinks is going on. I'll go across the same two pins here. What does the, what does the Keithley say? The Keithley says uh, 15 mega ohms. Yeah, 15 mega ohms is pretty good. Let me push the button. There we go, 210 uh, kilo ohms. Um, yeah, all right, a little bit different, uh, different measurement. Probably different burden voltage and stuff. This is, this is sourcing a particular current and the other meters sourcing a different current. You're gonna get slightly different readings in, a, in an active circuit. Um, but there you go. All right, so what are we gonna do? We're gonna be using my new uh, toy, which is my uh, SG-503. Um, sine wave generator. So let's hook him up. Let's see here. All right, so I have the function generator coming in to the switch and we're going to be monitoring the input of the switch with channel one, the output with channel two. And there we go. So we're getting some leakage through uh, the device. Um, so it's not entirely isolated. There is some uh, AC coupling through the device. Um, probably due to capacitance and stuff. Let's change the, uh, eh, about the same. So this is a four megahertz, 10 megahertz, 16 megahertz. I got about the same amount of leakage through. Let me turn on the switch. So now the uh, input and the output are the same. And let's go up, this is a two megahertz. 4.7, 9.6, 18 megahertz. Oh, 44 megahertz, it doesn't like. So 18 megahertz, let's go down. Uh, there's a little bit of dip right there. If you can see that, the, uh, oops. We get a little dip. So there's probably some capacitance in there. We get a little bit of resonance on that little capacitor in there right around 11 megahertz. We go up, here's another one, right around 16 megahertz. Oh, and then there's a really bad one here at uh, 23 megahertz. So when you use these things, you have to worry about these, these capacitances and inductances and stuff. You'll get some resonances and um, you know just be aware of that. So they're not gonna be perfectly flat. You should characterize them. They're gonna be pretty flat up to you know 10 megahertz or so, but then uh, be wary that uh, it will it will kind of uh, do weirdness there. Let me pan down so you can see my number down, number down there, 23 megahertz. Uh, let's go up one, 36 megahertz. So it can run high in frequency here. Uh, that's completely dying at 40. Yeah, at uh, above 40 megahertz, it's completely dead. So, yeah, interesting. But I'd say it's completely usable up to, yeah, up, probably up to 20 megahertz, something like that. All right, quick uh, chip of the day, the MAX338. So if you're using a DG508 and you want to make it better, use one of these.